Today our gospel lesson is going to come from the book of John. We're reading from John chapter 6, verses 66 through 69. And I invite you to stand as you're able, in body or in spirit, for the reading of our gospel lesson. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. You know, in our life, sometimes there's moments we come to that we're like, okay, I got to commit. I got to jump in. I got to step in because there's no backing away from this moment. Like once I make this commitment, like I'm in with both feet. There's no backing away from what's fixing to happen right now. Like if you've ever, if you've ever bought a car and you're sitting there knee to knee and like you're fixing our sign and stuff, you're like, okay, like we're, I guess we're doing this. This is happening. We're doing this. And so you, we've been there. If you ever bought a house. You know that you better spend, you know, the week before that stretching out your hand, getting your hand good and ready to like sign your life away for the next six hours when you sign that paper. Like there's no backing away. You're in. You're doing it. You, you can't stop now. I think back to um, when Holly and I, one of our moments like that is when we moved from, from Ripley to Pedal. Uh, that was a that was an interesting uh, move in the life of the church. We'd been in Ripley for three years, and they told me when I went there, the church told me this. They said you'll be here for three to five years. In that three to five year period, if the conference likes you, they're going to move you. If we don't like you, we're going to move you. So okay, I know I know that's how it's going to work. So three to five years is where I'm going to be. So at the end of my third year. I actually had to have an emergency gallbladder surgery because never doubt the stupidity of your preacher. I waited too long to have it done. They had to go in and get, take it out. Then because I waited too long, they had to go in the next day and fish out the gallstones that had gone over to my liver because once again, remember, I am a moron. So I did that. I waited too long. So I'm laying in bed two days later, and, uh, and my Diaz calls. And I think, oh, great, he's calling just to check on me after surgery. So we're talking about 15 minutes. He said, what do you want to hear about your appointment? I said, what do you mean hear about my appointment? He said, well, you're moving to pedal. I said, okay, I guess I'm moving to pedal. So Holly was at work and I text her in all caps. I said, call me now. Her response was, are you okay? Because remember, I just had surgery. I, I said, yes. She said, where are we moving? <laughs> Up until that point, this was 2010. Up until that point, we had lived in parsonages our entire ministry, the, the house provided by the church. This was our first purchase of our own home. Pedal had a housing allowance. We had no clue what we were doing. We didn't know a single thing in the world. And we were moving five hours away from Ripley, up close to Tennessee, down to Pedal. We're, we're, and we, oh, by the way, we had a six-week window to do all this as well. So we're, we're driving down when we can to look at houses. We're stressed out. We're looking at money. Uh, Holly's on the Internet. One day I come home from work, and she had been sick of looking at Zillow and houses forever. We were stressed about the move and all that. And she just looked at me and said, Andy, this move is not of God. <laughs> and remember, she's the calm one. So I look at her and say, yeah, yeah, it is. God's calling us to this. We know what we're doing. Well, we don't know what we're doing. We, we trust what he's doing. And we're committed. We're going to do this. And it was one of the best experiences of our lives, one of the, one of the, some of the best ministry we had in our life was in that setting. And so it was such a blessing. But at the time, we're like, okay, Lord, I guess we're doing this because I have no clue what's happening, so you're going to have to, Jesus, take the wheel because this is not going to go well if I've got the wheel. Commitment's hard, y'all. Commitment's a challenge. We are in this season of stewardship. We've talked about, you know, we've talked this, in this season 
about our stewardship t conversation being more educational than motivational. You know, I, I don't want y'all to get so fired up about, you know, what's happening here that you write down a million-dollar pledge, unless you really want to, um, and then say, oh, I didn't mean that. You know, I want you to understand kind of how our commitment works and what the levels of commitments look like and how we do it. So we talked about our facilities. You've heard from trustees. You've heard from outreach and about our missions. You've heard from our youth and our children. You've heard from worship. You've heard from all these different places about the importance of commitment and the importance of what this means and what, the importance of how we do this together, how it's us together. And that's why I love, I love, 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 love the text we read today. It's one of my favorite texts in all the Bible because you look at what Jesus did, y'all. Jesus would have been a terrible church growth expert because Jesus would get a crowd. He'd, he'd get a good crowd, and then he'd get this crowd there, and then he'd say something to make them angry, and they'd all leave. Or he'd say something to challenge them or to push them or to get them to think, and then they would leave. It happens over and over in Jesus' ministry. where he has got a crowd, he says something, and they scatter to the wind. And we see that today. If we'd have read all of John 6, we'd have seen, we'd have seen some of Jesus' difficult and challenging teaching. And then they, all the crowd leaves. They all leave. Then he looks at the disciples and said, paraphrasing, about y'all. Y'all going to bail too? Y'all going to leave as well? And Peter said, Lord, where else could we go? For only you have the words of life. We're committed. We're committed. Commitment's hard, y'all. It is. It's hard. But I think if you could distill down the gospel into one of its simplest understandings, the gospel is this. Jesus is Lord. That's the gospel. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord of all of our lives, of every part of our life, of all that we are, all that can, we can be, all of our dreams, all of our goals, all of our purposes. We submit all this to the Lordship of Jesus, that Jesus Christ is Lord. That, that, that's what it means to be a Christian. The word Christian means little Christ. To be a Christian means to submit our life, our wills, our dreams, our goals, to submit everything to the lordship of Jesus. That's our calling. That's our purpose. That is our goal. That's what we're trying to do here at church is to make disciples, to make those who have Jesus as their Lord in everything. On Sunday morning, yes, but throughout the rest of their week, with their calendars, with their schedules, with their finances, with their with their with their, with their with their with their words, with their social media, with all of it, that there's not a single area of our life that Jesus Christ is not Lord. That's what the gospel means, and that's what it means to be a Christian: is to make Christ Lord of everything. But y'all, here's the problem. That's really hard. I think of something one of my mentors used to always say, Dr. Bryson. He said, Jesus isn't hard to understand. Jesus is just hard to follow. Loving your enemies is not hard to understand. I just don't want to do it. Loving your enemies is not a complicated subject or concept. I just don't want to love them. They're my enemies. I don't like them. Having Jesus be Lord of our life is not a hard concept. It's just hard to do sometimes, apart from his grace. I had an encouraging lunch this week or coffee with an old friend of mine, my college roommate, freshman year at Colian. He's a church planner now in Vancouver, or actually right out from Vancouver, uh, Richmond, Canada, uh, right, out, right outside of the Vancouver area. Um, 
if you'd have seen the two of us in college, two goofballs, you're thinking, how in the Lord can the Lord, how in the world can the Lord use those two? Yet here we are, both as pastors. He has the only uh, the community he's in, a quarter of a million people, 25, 250,000 people. The only English speaking Protestant church in that town. Where he lives, being a Christian's hard. Being a Christian is swimming against cultural waters. Being a Christian is a challenge there. If you're a Christian in that part of the world, people are going to look down upon you and upon your character. They're going to think you're not a good person for being a Christian there. That's very different from where we live, isn't it, y'all? That's very different from here. So our challenge sometimes to make Jesus Lord of our life is not, is not, not the temptation, not the temptation, y'all, to make something bad Lord of our life. But our temptation is going to be to take something that's actually good and make that Lord of our life. I'll tell you what I mean by that. I'm straight up stealing this from Tim Keller. Tim Keller talks about this. Whatever it is in your life, if it's not Jesus, if that is Lord of your life, in time, you will destroy that thing, and that thing will destroy you. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Let's say, let's say your job is the most important thing in your life. Let's say you have made your job the Lord of your life. Let's say your career and your success in your career is Lord of your life. Let's say that's what defines you. What happens when you get fired? What happens when you retire? What happens when you change jobs? What happens if your career takes another turn? If your identity is found in that thing, if that thing is Lord of your life, then in time, that thing will crush you if something goes wrong. And likewise, if your job is all that you're worried about, then you're probably going to be so unhealthy in your work that you're not going to be a particularly good employer or employee. Outside of my faith, the most important thing in my life is my wife and my children. But let's say I make Holly and our marriage the Lord of my life. That that's the most important thing in my life is that right there. What happens to my identity if something goes wrong in my marriage? What happens if I place all of my worth and my identity in her? Well, I'm going to have to, not only is that going to hurt my identity and hurt who I am, but I'm going to have such outsized expectations of her that she can't meet them. That if my identity is completely wrapped up in her, and if she in our marriage is Lord of my life, then that's going to make me disordered in who I see myself as. But frankly, that's going to place such an expectation upon her that no person can meet. What if I make my children the Lord of my life? What if my children are the Lord of my life? And then what happens if my children fail in some way? Or they get it wrong? Or something happens? What happens when I want a football player and they don't play football? So what then happens is I'm then crushed by their inadequacies or whatever that I perceive them to be. Or I should put such pressure on them to be who I want them to be instead of who God made them to be that I destroy our relationship. Do you see what happens? Do you see what happens when anything other than Jesus is Lord of our life? In time, we will destroy that thing, and that thing will destroy us. But when Jesus is Lord of your life, when Jesus is Lord of my life, then I can be the husband and the father. I can be the friend. I can be the pastor that God has called me to be. I can't make this church the Lord of my life. What happens when we have a low crowd? If we don't meet budget, what happens if SPRC fusses at me? then my identity is crushed. And then I drive you too hard. 
When Jesus Christ is Lord, everything else falls into place. But y'all, if there's anything, if there's anything, even a good thing, that you have made Lord of your life other than Jesus, in time, you will, that thing will crush you, and you will crush it. The gospel is this. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord of our lives, of our schedules, of our hearts, of everything. Jesus is Lord. So may we orient our life around him. May we place him in the center of our life and when we make him Lord of all that we are, all that good we can be, all that we can desire, it is in that moment, in that moment, when he is truly Lord, that we find our purpose, our calling, and find our very life. Today, may we not replace Christ as Lord with even a good thing, but may we keep him Lord above all things. And then may all things in our life make sense because of that. Jesus is Lord. Let's pray.